I've been married for 15 years. Three kids, Michael Jason and Marcy Nicehouse, two newish cars and a wife that can afford to work for a nonprofit because we really don't need the money. I have a job that interests me and the workload has dropped in the last four years, reasonable hours, occasional travel for work and pleasure. I thought I had it made wife family two car garage in a good school district. What more could you want until I came in from work and my wife Andrea was sitting in the kitchen looking nervous. Hey, what's up with you? What's wrong? Are the kids all right? Her face contorted. They're fine, Jeffrey, but I've got some really, really bad news to deliver. I'm leaving you to Mary James Pan and it's nothing you did. There's nothing you can do to change my mind. I've emptied my closet and bureau. Everything else is yours. I felt my gut roll. Who the hell is James Pan and what's he got that I haven't you love him? I do love him. We've been seeing each other for about a year. He's the governor's cousin from the side of the family that inherited most of the family fortune. The children and I will move in with him in Greenville, Delaware. That Buchanan, I can hardly believe it. You've been screwing him for a year, and I never had a clue I was stunned. The world as I know it is gone. It's true, then, the husband is the last to know. Well, I guess I made it easy for you. Me trusting you implicitly are the children mine. Of course they are. How could you think that of me? Oh, yes, they yours. She was nick-looking, but not a stunner and nothing out of the ordinary in bed unless she must have worked a lot harder to please him than she ever did with me. But what's the point? The pain was turning to a bitter anger, but I was able to keep control of myself. Huh? I guess I've been screwing a million dual escort. I glared at her, jumped to my feet, and gestured towards the door. Well, get the hell out of my house and don't let the door hit you on the way out, you goddamn cheating witch. Enjoy the good life until until he dumps you for someone younger. I have nothing more to say to you. She tossed an envelope on the table and moved quickly out the door, and I sat and cried. I went upstairs to lie down and saw that the children's rooms had been emptied out, including the pictures they had hung on the walls. It felt like I was living in a tomb in the weeks to follow. She and James Buchanan refused to let me talk with my kids. It was Macy who snuck out and knocked on my door. We worked out a clandestine meeting arrangement. I got six burner phones and gave the kids one of the numbers. Every couple of weeks, I gave them a new number. So if anyone checked their phones, my numbers were only called occasionally. We were careful about emails, which could only be sent from the library computers or a friend's computer. I used the name Lenny Elmore, after Elmore Leonard, the wonderful author, as my email name again to hide from my ex. So I kept up with their lives not as often as I would like. Well, Macy called every other day, usually on a friend's phone, and the boys about once or twice a week in the months that followed follow it didn't get better. Words cannot describe the fury hurt depression that washed over me that was drowning me. Andrea had traded up in marriage so far up that she didn't bother to ask for any of our assets alimony or child support. There was no point, I guess, to her credit. She asked for nothing of any commercial value, but what she did take was priceless. My three children, we sometimes read stories where a woman is offered a million dollars to have sex with some guy. Usually it's women we wonder about the assumption being that most guys would do it for free. The goofy part of that question is who would pay a million bucks for sex, especially for sex with an average person. I guess that Buchanan has tens of millions of dollars, so I can see. Her bailing for that, who knows? Maybe it was love, I can say for sure. I wouldn't have run off with a Mrs. Buchanan, but I suppose you don't know until someone offers and the kid's too hiding contact with me. I guess it's the money, too, the promise of a free Ivy League education, along with the more immediate pleasures of the lifestyle big money can bring. Cars close skiing in Aspen summer in France doesn't compare with surf fishing at the Jersey Shore with pop. But neither does it excuse my children for not insisting on having a foot in each camp. I thought I brought them up better than that. But then they are kids. The biggest thing was still what the hell did Buchanan see in her? She really didn't stand out in any crowd. I could imagine she was middling in about everything. She was really good with people, but so are a lot of people people, as to our friends most stayed cordial. But now being single, occasionally I was asked to a party, and I did have a couple of buddies to fish with, but I was really lonely without my best friend, and I felt like damaged goods, which I was, I thought of suing them. But my lawyer told me to forget it, that I really didn't have a chance. And for what, I make good money, $130,000 a year, which is a nice living, but against Buchanan. So I caved and tried to get on with my life, like I said, in that wrenched first year. I really had a hard time. My home was now just a house, functionally. I was on the very edge of my children's lives. I wasn't fit to date women either. 
Really, it was my daughter that got me through that horrible year I kept it together by immersing myself in work. I mean, what else could I do? I felt sorry for myself, buried in self-pity, rolled in misery like a dog. And for almost a year after six months of that, I sold the damn house and got an apartment in town, cut way back on overtime, and began to flesh out ideas I had come up with over the years, but were ignored by the elderly guys in management. I realized I was a better businessman that the fools running the company ever see clearly the way for the business to grow and prosper, but the management couldn't let go of the old business model they developed years ago, which successfully built the business, but was wrong for today's world and was taking it down. It was like I was sailing on the Titanic with me, the only one who could see the iceberg. What could you do besides dress warmly and stand near the lifeboats reading the launch instructions? My job search was producing nothing until out of the blue I got a job interview from a company that bought one of our smaller competitors. They wanted me to implement my employer's old business model so they could grow their company in a series of interviews. I pointed out the problems with that and outlined my own ideas. They were actually willing to pay a premium to lure me away from Titanic Incorporated, and more besides because their business was in Chestertone, Maryland. I was able to negotiate a big vacation package by agreeing to take most of one day a week in a contract tied to business growth and profits. Apparently, they had had trouble getting people to relocate to a backwater charming or not. Chestertone is as chaotic in the summer as it is dead in the winter. I jumped at the chance to make a clean break of it, changed my email address, got a new phone number. Of course, my children knew, but not their mother. Of course, in this age of the Internet, if you live your life, you cannot really disappear, but I thought of it as a way to reinvent myself, as neither my former employer nor my former wife valued me, and it helped to put them in the fuzzy light of the past. Now, I didn't get big-time rich like Buchanan, but I did real well by my standards. And as the business took off, I was able to hire talented young people to implement the business plan. After a few years, I found myself with a nice equity position and began working from home a lot and let others do the day-to-day -day stuff. I rented a place for a while until I found a big three-bedroom craftsman-style bungalow on a lot with a view. But within walking distance of Chesteron, the big demand here is for old historic homes. But houses from the 1920-1930 are modern houses, and pretty reasonably priced as a bonus, it had $20,000 of woodworking tools in a heated garage that the old guy bought new when he retired, but never got around to learning how to use. I joined the local historical society, volunteered for this and that, put myself out there, as they say, but unfortunately the selection of suitable mates was thin. I was 45 years old, relatively few single women in the 35 to 40 age group, and of the few of a suitable age, well, I'll get shot for saying this, but the education level of the year-round residents was mixed, and the summer people were generally too high in for my taste. One of the members of the historical society asked me if I could fix an electrical problem on his boat. I like the old guy, so he and I spent Saturday on the boat, and I fixed a plethora of assorted problems. We took it out for a short cruise, and I found I liked sailing, and he liked company, so he taught me sailing. We worked out a trade. I'd keep all the mechanical SL electrical stuff running. He's pay someone to the endless cosmetic restoration and cleaning. And I could take it out more or less. It will. I just had to call in advance if it was a day sale often as not we would go out together. I should tell you that I could have bought the damn boat, but I'm cheap. And who wants the expense of owning and maintaining a boat? I was at the marina changing the oil in the auxiliary engine and heard hoots and shrieks as a boat was a nepple wallowing up to the dock. I grabbed a boat hook and trotted over. Seeing the run of the tide, I called for the stern rope they threw it short. But I could just hook it and pull the stern to the dock whereupon, and the tide pushed the bow so I could catch that rope which was dragging in the water and tied them fast. The idiot at the wheel was drunkenly insisting I join their party for dinner at one of the expense account restaurants nearby. I had no interest in spending the evening with a bunch of honking drunks and politely demurred when a really good-looking woman came up beside Captain Rum. Don't be put off by Wallace. I would like you to come to dinner with us after all you rescued us so much you can infer from Ascension. She was sober, no rings on her left hand, Nick-looking, educated, faint British accent with a body built for comfort. Now would you be sitting alongside me at dinner? Hoots of teasing laughter from the boat he hooked the boat, and you hooked him way to go. Heather, we were smitten with each other. Heather was seven years younger than me, 
worked in a law office in Washington, D.C., writing laws and regulations for lobbyists. She was a gorgeous thing. Not Hollywood gorgeous, but somebody I certainly would pick out of a crowd. As we talked, I found she shared my politics, love of old things, the water, and reading she couldn't have children which bothered her years ago when she got the news, but over the years became reconciled with it me after the experience I had with mind that didn't bother me at all. Heather, I don't want this night to end. No strings here. Would you stay at my house? I have a guest bedroom with a locking door. Not that you need to got your driver's license with you. Give it to me, I handed it over. She took a picture of it with her phone, emailed it there. If I don't come back in one piece, my mother will come after. You Can you drive me to Waldorf Sunday night? Sure, where's Waldorf? No cows around the restaurant. But I waved to a couple of older women I knew fairly well who were just leaving, and I asked them if they could drop us off at the marina where my car was one of them had set me up with with two blind dates, and was delighted to see I was sweet on Heather after the introductions to Grant Yulia, who prefers to be called Lily. They teased Heather. Lily started in Jeffrey as a real asset to Chester Tone. I tried to fix him up with a local girl or two, but my mistake was not being able to find anybody who looks as lovely as you. We want to keep him here. So when you marry him, you have to agree to live here, Grace chimed in. He can cook fix anything and has a good income. Plus, he's nice to sweet old ladies. Heather gave it right back. Well, if he's been rejected by all of the young women around here, maybe I should be careful. They must know something. I don't, Lily, or... More likely, you recognize what you've got there, B, regularly. But a very disheveled dresser. He does need taken care of, ladies. Please. I just met Heather this afternoon. You scare her away. We didn't have sex that weekend. But the next weekend, we took the boat out and we drilled like rabbits as both of us us were ending a long, dry spell. Physically, she was the opposite of my ex-wife. The ex was short, skinny, and blonde. Heather was almost as tall as me. Nicely rounded body and jet black haired. She was English, her father from Avery, England, and her mother from Madras, India. Best of all, we laughed at each other's jokes. Unfortunately, she was also the polar opposite of my ex-wife in not-so-good ways. Andrea was willing to try anything you ever read about or saw in a spicy film and willing to do it a lot. Heather liked sex, but she was pretty uptight. I was puzzled because she talked a good game but was really limited in bed. And if it wasn't getting any better, I had no trouble getting her to climax, but she thought blowjobs, dirty talk, outdoor sex, and just about everything else was perverted or disrespectful to her personally. I was about to reluctantly toss her back into the dating pool when I got an inspiration one cold, wet day in the fall. We walking into Chesterton one Saturday, and I realized that she was the only woman in the town still wearing sandals. I wondered if she had a foot fetish. I got two drinks in her that evening at the restaurant and a glass of wine at the house, so she was pretty laid back, Heather. Some people feel that sex can be gross or humiliating and that loving people should be dignified when in bed together. I think my job is to do for you whatever you enjoy and that your job is to do for me whatever I enjoy. Jeffrey, don't you like making love with me? What are you talking about? What we do, you and I, is love making. You're good at that, but there's also lusty drilling and sex play, and we haven't done anything like that tonight. I'd like to play at sex, not getting into the details, but we had a grand finish. It was the first lesson I taught her in the pleasurably long and delightful journey of how to give and get great sex this year. The weather was remarkable mild well until October, and our romance was perhaps the happiest time for me in decades once a week weather permitting we'd sail on Chesapeake Bay. Often it was warm enough to shed our clothes for a while within another boat in sight and have a beer swim and generally screw hard once or twice and snuggling under a blanket as the boat rocked us to sleep and then to make love in the cool dawn that fall we fell in love. Chester Tone is 150 years away from D.C. and lifestyle, but only an hour and a half by car that winter she sold her Waldorf condo and rented a pie to Tara in D.C., moving in with me in Chester Tone. She has a somewhat flexible schedule, and most weeks spend a couple of nights in D.C. and the rest with me. I proofread her stuff, not so much for spelling and grammar, but for clarity and completeness. I would be bullshitting to say that I truly understood everything she wrote, but in the moment I could follow it. And if I couldn't, there was a problem with it. She was a bit more social than me. But I liked people, too. And we both enjoyed going out with her friends in town, my near home. And life was good. She had to go into D.C. one Sunday morning to spend the next couple of days preparing for a case. And as it happened, 
The town council meeting I had attended was over sooner than expected that Monday, so to surprise her, I drove to the apartment getting there about 9.30, no sign of her, so I called and her phone went a voicemail, I admit having been blindsided by my cheating, which of an ex-wife it worried me a bit. She returned my call an hour later saying she was taking a break but would be working half of the night we chatted, me wondering how to ask her where she was when she volunteered it. This is turning out to be a hell of a week we found out Sunday that our office didn't do on the federal truck standards. So this morning, we all decamped to the Weston and Ferrax to get it done by 2 p.m. tomorrow. I'll be lucky to sleep at all tonight. The only good news is I'll be able to be back in Chestertone a day early. Oh, good. Actually, the council meeting ended early, so I thought I'd surprise you. I'm at the apartment. Oh, you poor thing. Spend the night. I should be back about noon or one we can have lunch. I'd normally take you up on that, but I need to get back and in the morning and you'll be exhausted. Honey, I'm so sorry I missed you. At least I'll catch your scent when I slide between the sheets. I'll be missing you. I'll take a long nap at the apartment tomorrow and be home in time for a late supper. I love you. A week later, she said I realized I have to shut my phone off a lot when I'm in meetings or just so I can concentrate. But then I don't know who was calling, so I got a smartphone for just you and me. We can set it up so you can track me that way. You'll know where I am. I don't need to know that I trust you. She laughed, and I trust you as well. But I have no secrets from you, and you never know that phone feature may come in handy sometime for some other reason, so she gave me the gift of knowledge which wasn't so good for Adam and Eve, but for me. I checked where she was a few times and never bothered again. We had had the biblical seven years of good luck, and I wondered if it was coming to an end when I opened my door one Saturday morning to be greeted by my ex-wife. I wrinkled my nose and said, out dead to me as I shut the door. Of course, Heather heard what happened. Who is that my ex-wife I told her to F off, but now she's was knocking again on how nice invite her in. I told her she was dead and shut the door on her. Heather glared at me. It's my house too, and you'll be nice to her if only because she's a guest in our house. Things are obviously going very poorly for her, or she wouldn't be here. Heather smiled as she opened the door. My husband tells me you're Andrea. How nice to finally meet you. I'm Heather, by the way. I looked at her more carefully and shivered a little. Andrea was always thin, but now she looked gunt with sunken eyes and cheeks. My first thought was what the hell did I ever see in her? And the second had me wondering if she was seriously ill. Andrea looked at me wily and said, I'm sorry to intrude. I won't be long. Heather slid right in with, don't worry about that. We're staying at home this afternoon. We were thinking of going out, but Jeffrey has some yard work to get done on putting water on. I do. So want to talk with you. Did you have a pleasant drive down? I took the hint and went outside. Call me when the coffees dripped and left them to themselves. It must have been 20 minutes later, Heather called coffees ready. I had put the last quart of oil in the mower and went in the house to clean my hands and pour a coffee I sat with them as they finished their chatter. Peace came over me. I realized, thankfully, that I had no feelings for Andrea at all. No love, no hate, zero emotions of any consequence. And looking at the two of them, I can honestly say I was well rid of her. The coffee mugs were finally empty. So after all these years, Andrea, I don't suppose this is a social call. No, it isn't. You have two daughters. The youngest is seven years old and needs a kidney transplant. Jesus, what a bombshell. No, of course I knew she and Buchanan had daughter, but mine can't be. You don't say that's too bad. But as you know, I've never met this child, so why don't you go to Switzerland or, or wherever money can buy everything and fix her that's got nothing to do with me? So for the second time, why are you here? My husband's shooting blanks and handing me an envelope. I knew you would be doubtful. So I got the DNA reports. I didn't have a sample of your DNA, but all of your children have the same father. She's your flesh and blood. We're having trouble finding a kidney match, and she in total kidney failure. Jeffrey, she won't live all that long, and the doctors think you're likely a match I'm not, or I wouldn't be here. I'm here to ask you to be checked for a match, and if so, to save her life by donating a kidney, I'll pay you anything you ask. Heather saw me starting to go orbital and put her hand on my arm, squeezed hard, and jumped in. We need to discuss this. Why don't you email us the detailed information and we'll discuss it and get back to you every day. She's suffering. Andrea, let me talk to Jeffrey. I'll call you the day after tomorrow, I promise. 
Heather stood up and rummaged in the desk for one of my business cards as Andrea was leaving. I couldn't help saying sarcastically it was nice to hear how the number of my ex-child is multiplying. Do let me know if any more pop out. Drive carefully on your way back to where you came from. I shut the door while Heather walked Andrea to the car, talking earnestly. I reheated a cup of coffee, thinking the nerve of the witch to rub her money in my face and went out to my shop. Heather called me a couple hours later for supper. Well, there's what I'd call a troubled woman. Her child is dying, facing a slow death, and the only best hope is a big-time favor from a guy who hates her, and that weren't enough. Her marriage is shaky, that about sum it up. I don't hate her, I just despise her, and I don't despise her for dumping me, but rather for depriving me of my children and depriving my children of me. She thinks she has it rough facing the loss of a kid. Okay, my kids aren't dead, but they might as well be because they aren't really a part of my life. You think the kid's really mine? I doubt she'd lie about that. I imagine you'll find out pretty quickly if they check you for a kidney match. I gotta read up on that. I really don't know nothing about kidney disease transplants or anything like that. You make her any promises, just what you heard me say about calling her Tuesday. The child is stable, but not good. And Jeffrey, I'll support you, whatever. Comes I got looking up on Wikipedia, the National Kidney Foundation website and whatever, and found that the kid eventually dies without a new kidney, there is a huge shortage of kidneys. The best outcome is if the donor is a close match to the recipient, the kid would probably get a transplant at some point, but it would be a miserable time for her until she got one, and she might still die of kidney failure. Sunday night, I poured Heather a glass of the good wine we saved for company, not the usual plunk we have on the table, you realize I would love to kick that to the curb and throw her under a bus. She hasn't changed a bit had she not absolutely needed me. She never would have told me about my daughter. But I have to do this, you know, that don't you? This what throw her under the bus or donate a kidney. We both laughed. It broke the tension, love. I wish the kid was okay. I wish I wish your children were part of our lives. And I wish you got to keep both kidneys. But if I had a child, I know I'd do anything I needed to do to save her. And I know you feel the same way. So I understand why you need to give her your kidney. I saw that strength, that courage and loyalty in you before I married you. I was thinking, so she gave us a get out of jail free card, didn't she? What do we want to come out of all this right now? All the pain and blood is all on me. Well, my daughter too. How can I get the ex and her husband to put some blood in the game? I don't know why you would care. Forget Em. Focus on what you want. Do you know what you really want? No, I never really gave it a thought. Do you? She patted my arm and smiled. You need to answer that question. Not me, I was thinking when my other kids were growing up, I was working so hard to bring home the money working on the house and cars that I didn't get, get to enjoy my children much, and then they were gone. So here's a daughter I don't know at all. I'd like to be part of her life, have my picture taken standing next to her on prom night. They still have proms, don't they? Heather nodded. I'd like to raise her as I wish I could have raised my older children. That's what I want, Jesus. Jeffrey, you want custody, Sheck, never give you that. And it would be traumatic for the child, too. I'd be happy to have Karen on a weekend or two. That might work. I think she might give us custody. Remember the judement of Solomon. Two women claim a child. Solomon decided to cut the kid in half. One half for each claimant. One woman agreed the other renounced her claim rather than the child die. Solomon declared her the mother. Andrea will do the same, but I want her to have to work for it, Jeffrey. You don't believe that you can't make custody a condition of donating a kidney, a kidney for the kid, the kid for a kidney. What are you thinking? A lot of thoughts running around in my mind right now. You're right. I can't require custody as a quid pro quo. The kid gets my kidney. But I was thinking, Andrea doesn't have to know that I had worked hard to push the rage out of my heart years ago and did a good job of it, too. But seeing Andrea and the secret child, it came flooding back. I wanted revenge on Andrea, too, but I didn't tell Heather that that night we worked out the framework of a deal, and one of the lawyers Heather worked with offered to work it up into something nice, legal, and enforceable. Just before we went up to Greenville, I added a page at the end. Took me almost 20 minutes to find the same font the goddamn lawyers used. I wanted everything to match Monday. She called Miriam and set up a family meeting between us. Miriam, her husband James, and my three older children, we stipulated that Karen not be present, which was only common sense. I went up the day before for a tissue match, which proved she was my daughter, and that I was an excellent match for a kidney donation, while I was doing all that Heather spent the better part of the day visiting with Andrea and the children, and they got along quite well the next day. Heather and I sat down with the Buchanans. 
James was clearly annoyed at the whole thing. Andrea was sick with worry, and my other kids weren't much better. They did look good wearing quality clothing, expensive haircuts. Perfect teeth. Well, I read up on all this, and the Kidney Foundation is a really good charity. I'd like to see them come out ahead on this. So it turns out that you were correct. Andrea Karen is my daughter, and the good news is that I'm a good match to donate a kidney for her, but what you're asking me to do is to undergo major surgery. Pop out one of my kidneys and give it to a stranger, but check your child, said my ex-wife, no. She's the child of James and Andrea Buchanan. I waved towards them. You all left my life abruptly and for good, and none of you ever told me about Karen until you absolutely had to. I have every reason to expect you'll cloister Karen away from me as well. Just as soon as you get your pound of flesh out of me, plus this is all on me. Not one of you will have shed a drop of blood, not a minute of pain. I mean, you folks don't have any skin in the game, do you? Sorry, but the continuation of my genes isn't that big a deal in my life. Andrea's face was contorted in anguish. There has to be a way, Wick, do anything to save her anything you want. I paused a bit for dramatic effect. What will it take, you ask? Well, two things for one. I want some time with my daughter, 72 days a year, 20% her time, she'll live with Heather, and I. Andrea, would you think that's fair, eh? What's that, two weekends a month? Well, that'd be 48 days. So at a week or two in the summer, that's about 15% of the time. So, okay, I would get her 15% of the time, and you 85% of the time. Okay, so you agree that would be fair. She looked at her husband, who shrugged and said, More than fair, I think so too. We agree on that now, consider what I will be going through perfectly healthy. Getting cut open and an organ removed to help someone else live, how many of you in my place would be willing to do what you were asking me to do? Raise your hand. The three women's hands shot up my two sons a few seconds later, and hesitantly James's hand so you'd all be willing to do what you want me to do. They looked at each other, nodding. Then we have the makings of a deal that will help the Kidney Foundation too on one day, Andrea and I will donate kidneys, one to Karen and one of the transplant program. And when I come out of out of surgery, James goes in to donate a kidney to the foundation as well. When that happens, Karen gets my kidney. I get custody of Karen. What did we say? 15% of the time. That seems fair to us all. How's that sound? You two will be written up in the paper as heroes. James saw a distinction. You take credit for it all. What's credit to me? You can say it was your idea. You're all the more noble because your donation is going to strangers, not to kin. Everybody nodded they were good with it, but James didn't look all that happy. I gave him a verbal poke. You okay with this, Jim? He quickly put on his public happy face mask. Sure, sure, it's a good thing to do. And it helps lots of people. So why not? Andrea. They all smiled and nodded. Andrea gushed. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jeffrey. You don't know what this means to me. You're wrong about that. Andrea, I do know what this means to you, in fact, more than you realize. But we all agree that Andrea James and I will donate a kidney, nodding all around, okay? So here's the contract for you all to sign. There is a penalty clause on the next to last page, which is my second condition. And Andrea and James have to initial it and date it. James got serious in a hurry. What the hell is this about a contract? We all family here that's not called for. And I for one won't sign my replacement was grating on my nerves. The pomp is prick. We're all a family here, Jimmy. Only like the interlocking Olympic rings, different families, my wife and are a family, and you, Andrea, and the children are a family, and the children, Andrea and myself, are a biological family, so the family bid is sort of muddled. Then the nice thing about contracts is everybody knows what they are agreeing to in advance, and the penalty clause if for any reason either of you cannot or will not donate a kidney. Heather and I get custody of Karen. She takes my last name and the custody figures, which we all agreed were fair reversed. We get her 85% of the time, you get her 15% of the time. Of course, we lee into this, but if one of you were nigs, she'll be registered in the spring for school in Chester Tone Pandemonium. I had to raise my voice, people, 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 if you all go through with the deal. You get what you all agreed was exactly what you all felt was fair. Only if one of you well chess. Do I get custody of just one, just one mind? You just one of my four children letting not be greedy here. Andrea spoke up. We'll take it, Karen Lefts. That is the big thing here. It's what we all want. It's win-win. She grabbed a pin and signed James Bode. So, Jeff, what happens if you don't go through with it? Andrea and I donate kidneys. You do nothing and Karen dies. I smiled. Good thinking. 
Jimmy, of course I come out of surgery before you go in, but there might be a problem of some sort. Here's a letter from the Kidney Foundation that in return for two kidneys donated to the foundation, they will put Karen at the head of the list, but you have my word, I will go through with it. What more assurance can I give? But my word. Andrea was melting down sign at James for our daughter's sake. James was hesitant. I'm not sure she's Andrea jumped on him. Shut up. There's no good way to finish that thought sign, the goddamn thing, a week later. Andrea went under the knife, and as soon as the surgeon took a piss and changed his scrubs, they cut into me after I came out of the anesthetic in the ICU. They moved me to a private hospital room Heather had been with me in the ICU. But as soon as I was settled in the private room, she and Macy came in talking with each other. I got an update on Andrea and Heather telling me the doctor said I was fine. Macy looked me in the eye and told me she regretted how James and Andrew had tried to demonize me, Dad. It was like some kind of almost cult thinking, like a sacrifice we needed to make for the future. I mean, it's stupid on the face of it now, but we were kids and James and Mom like where they were all on a different planet. She started crying I'd hold you in my arms and hug you, but I'm not up to it at the moment. Heather was right there, I can hug you, Macy. I forgive you and your dad as well. Come on, you were a kid then. And you did what you could, but in the future, Jeffrey and I want you to be an integral part of our life. My son, Mike, came in the door at that point. Good, you're awake. I'm going to donate a kidney, too. I signed up for it while you were under James bailed by the way he's postponed it into the indefinite future, but it'll never happen. Gee, Mike, I don't know. Is that such a good idea? You've got your whole life ahead of you. I don't know. You don't have to. You know, the deal is done. Your kidney doesn't let Jimmy off of the hook that had nothing to do with it. Karen gets to live with you guys. That's all to the good. I think Karen will be better off. I just gave my word. I said I'd do it. I mean, if my mother and my father could do it. And it is a good thing to do. You know, I've been watching Karen suffer. And as I understand it, they may be able to split my kidney and help two people. You had jaw Jimmy figured out, didn't you, Dad? You knew he wouldn't go through with it. And he absolutely hates to be called Jimmy. We'd get grounded for two weeks calling him that. Heather was looking at me as it dawned on her how I engineered this thing. I figured he wouldn't give anybody a pound of flesh, but I didn't want to admit it. But better yet, he would be the goat for Andrea losing her daughter. I really don't know Jimbo at all, never laid eyes on him until a week ago. He does seem like a bit of a stuffed shirt. He's not one of us, is he, Dad? You tell me he may be nothing to me, but I rather think he loves you too. That week began the rest of my life at first, when we had Karen for the weekends. One of her brothers or her sister would bring her down, and often enough the two of them would stay the day returning in late evening, and the wife or I would take her. Home Sunday. Pretty soon we had them Karen, and whoever drove her down for the whole weekend when that all went well, we went to Thursday night to Sunday night often enough I had my friend's boat, so we sailed and fished and swam all summer. We took Karen and her sister on vacation, seeing the sights of Washington, D.C., and then took the boys on the same tour. We extended the trips an extra day, because we couldn't get the kids out of the Smithsonian at the end of summer Andrea came down with Karen. The two of us chatted she was more relaxed and happy than I could ever remember. Heather gave us some time together. Jeffrey, you know, James and I aren't getting along well, don't you? No, actually, I didn't. Heather and I are going great, though. Maybe you ought to chat with her. You guys must have done something right in years past. The kids turned out well. James isn't, uh, hasn't really done much in the parenting department. You know, he was more of an older playmate than a father. Yeah, well... I guess it put a lot on you in the help from the little I've seen of him. He's not one for sacrifice and hard work. Well, with enough money, you can sit around and fritter your time away, I guess. Did you intend to drive a wedge between us, Andrea, when you bailed on me? You didn't give two shits about me, and now I really didn't give a thought to you, first of all. Like, you, I wanted Karen to live a normal life. And secondly, I wanted my children back in my life. I was, I am willing to share, but I resented greatly that you yourself would not. More than the divorce, I resented that. Well, that's all water under the bridge. I'm good with it now. So what's your problem with him by am renigging? I lost Karen, my baby, and now he's cheating on me, too. E I damn near choked, which morphed into a chuckle in the look on her face I started. Hearty laughter, you worthless witch. You were happy enough when you were cheating on your husband and denying him his children, weren't you? 
You really expect sympathy from me, turn about is fair play. Well, believe me, I really do know how you feel and agree. No one should have to give up a child, better line up a good divorce lawyer, you'll still be rich, or is there a prenup? She started to laugh too. Jeffrey, you can get me laughing, yes, Turnab, but is justice. But justice doesn't feel good for my end, there is a prenup, but yes, I'll be rich, but not happy that last bit is on you somewhere along the line, you missed an essential fact of life you have to find. Out what makes you happy, and then find someone who will enable you to do whatever it is that makes you happy. Only you can figure it out and make it happen. So what if James is not the man? Cut your losses and develop an exit strategy. Do what you did last time. Start looking, and when you find someone to be with you, someone to help you through the divorce, at least dump your second husband and marry your third. You're well-preserved. Skinny is still in fashion. You've got money. You play golf tennis and probably still great in bed. What are you lacking, seriously? Give Heather a call, whatever she did when her husband left her worked for her. She can at least, least calm and you're it with you more than I can. I started laughing again. I couldn't help myself. Andrea left in late afternoon later. Heather Karen and I walked into town for supper and back home that night in bed. I told Heather about our conversation, so you told her James was just doing to her what she did to you that wasn't nice, and she stifled a laugh you think she was making to run at you. That's an old-time phrase, isn't it? Make a run at you, don't be silly. She sees how happy I am, how much you and I love each other. Besides, I told her to talk with you that whatever you did after your divorce worked out fine for you, she can rot in hell for all I care. I went on to tell her how much I love you, Heather, and I had as grand a time that night as one could have and not wait. Karen Andrea eventually moved to Florida and invited us all there for Thanksgiving. She had the dinner catered, and it was awful, at least by home cooking standards. Thereafter, the children alternated going there at Christmas and New Year's at our place, and we all got together for a grand Fourth of July picnic in Chester Tone, the children did keep in touch with James, and to be fair, he took care of them financially myself. I only saw James twice after that once for Macy's marriage and again at Michael's marriage when Jason married Edward. We held the service in Chester. Tone James didn't reply to the invitation, but to his credit, he sent them a check a couple of weeks later. Oh, and Andrea, she spent a fortune on surgery over the years to sort of keep her looks, but surgery does nothing to make you beautiful inside. In a few short years, she became bitter and envious. The children decided that rather than all visit her, they'd take turns having her visit their houses for the various holidays. That way, the kids figured, as each took their turn in the barrel, none of them had to see her all that often. They tell me she's had a long string of lovers, but none stuck around for long. Not been a happy life for her, me and mine. I'm good.